I'm Lisa Stone, and you're listening to Parenting Aces. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and boy, are we in the middle of some crazy times right now. Rather than release a new podcast episode talking about coaching or talking about um, nutrition or fitness, I thought it might be prudent to go back into our archives and re-release some of our old episodes over the next few weeks. So I think that's what I'm going to do, and I hope y'all will bear with me. The episode that I'm re-releasing this week is actually from our very first season from 2012, and it's with David Benzel, who runs the Growing Champions for Life website and webinars. If you're not familiar with him, you will be after listening to this episode, but what David and I discuss is how we can work together to be better sports parents from how to talk to our children, how to better our body language when we're watching them compete, how to manage the car ride home, and a variety of other topics. So I hope you find this informative. I hope you will listen all the way through and share it. And just kind of on a personal note, um, my friend Saul Schwartz, who passed away a few years ago, actually called into this episode. So you'll hear Saul speaking as well. So it kind of warmed my heart to go back and listen to this and hear my friend. But I hope you're all hanging in there. I hope you're all maintaining your sanity through this crazy COVID-19 crisis, that you're all practicing safe practices in terms of washing your hands, social distancing, sheltering at home, and all of those things. And I also hope that you'll tune in on Wednesdays for Dewey, Evans, and me as we discuss a variety of topics, but right now really focusing around COVID-19 and the response to it, and what we can do as a tennis community. So enjoy this episode. Please stay healthy and safe. And thank you for continuing to be part of the Parenting Aces community. Good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. I'm Lisa Stone. Welcome to Parenting Aces on Blog Talk Radio's You Are Tennis. We are here today speaking with David Benzel, who is the founder of Growing Champions for Life, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the youth sport experience in America by working with us parents uh, to provide us with some good strategies and tools so that we can be better sports parents. David has uh, been speaking all over the country. I had the pleasure of meeting him when he was in Atlanta speaking at a local group, and um, he just has some amazing wisdom and advice to share. But for those of you who are new to our show, this is a call-in show, so if you have questions for me or for David, the call-in number is 714-583. 6853 again 714-583-6853 and David I'd like to welcome you to this week's show how are you hey thank you very much I'm excited to be here you're talking about my favorite topic (laughs) well yours and mine both so um, you're an experienced sports parent why don't you tell us a little bit about your own sports parenting background well, we have we have two children, and we we brought them through the uh, entire youth sport experience. Um, I might be a little older than some of your listeners because my children are now 28 and 24 years of age, and they both made it to the professional level in their respective sports. But I remember um, both of them starting at about four years of age in organized youth sports. And um, I was probably a pretty typical parent, um, gave them that gift, no strings attached. And then as we started to invest more and more time, energy, and money, I noticed that I was the one that changed. I got a little too intense. Um, I inadvertently put some pressure to perform on my kids and even took the fun out of sports sometimes. And I gradually realized that, that I was the one that needed to change. 
and I I just did. I just made up my mind that I was not going to um, behave in a way that was actually inhibiting my child's performances. So Growing Champions for Life is really uh, something that grew out of my journey uh, where I realized that I was sometimes too involved emotionally and actually making it more difficult for my child to perform at his or her potential. So when I when I say that I'm all about helping parents do a better job, it's still with the child in mind. I think our children can perform better. They can perform more consistently. They can have longer youth sport careers if we as parents know how to play our role more effectively. And I just realized I was the one that needed to change, not them. That's so interesting. As I had mentioned to you, Dr. Alan Fox was on our show a couple weeks ago, and he said something very similar in that uh, he put the onus on us as parents to make the decision to be better. And he said, that, you know, almost almost the exact words you just used, which were, you know, I realized I wasn't doing a very good job as a parent, and I needed to make the decision to make a change. So my question to you then is, how do you make that change? I mean, I my assumption is the people that are reading my Parenting Aces blog or tuning into the radio show realize that they could do it better. Um, that's why they're here. They want to learn how to do it better, just like I want to learn how to do it better. But, you know, specifically, I mean, it's one thing to say I want to do better. It's another thing to actually do better. How do yeah. we do better? Sure. That, that's a fair question because uh, it's it's what I call, uh, and actually there's a book by this title, so I didn't make this up on my own, the knowing-doing gap. <laughs> the the gap between knowing that you want to do something better and the you know and actually doing something different, and so what what we teach are some very specific strategies. And one of the foundation pieces of this is that we have, as parents have to sort of listen to the things we say and become aware of the times that we are we are judging, we are analyzing and critiquing our child's performances and catch ourselves in that act because that is that is the source of most of the problem. It's when we cross over from being supporters and witnesses of our child's experience, we, we switch from that to becoming judges and critics. And so when we're sitting in the stands and we're watching our child play and we find ourselves analyzing the performance and getting emotionally kind of sold out to what's going wrong and like we're noticing the deficiencies in their 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 in tennis their deficiencies in their their stroke or their strategy or their you know approach to the net or serving whatever it is we we have now crossed over and it's almost inevitable we're going to go to our child and we're going to start telling them in one way or another sometimes subtly sometimes not so subtly here's what you did wrong here's what you need to do better and we immediately have sent the message to our children, whether we mean to or not, I'm disappointed. And mm-hmm. we've got to catch ourselves and stop ourselves from falling into that role. And how do we do that? Well, you, you have to you, 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 you got to listen to what you're saying and even what you're thinking. Because, you see, we don't have to judge everything. We could look at a tennis match and enjoy the miracle of our child out there hitting the ball and realize that our assignment is to witness that, to cheer for it, and then to wait. And wait till our children want to talk about it. Wait till they have something they want to ask us. And we set our kids up for a more confident conversation with us if they know that we're not coming at this from a position of of critiquing and analyzing but instead, we're there to, to be a resource. So if my child comes to me, like my son played baseball, so I, I always wanted to talk about it right after the game, and it took me the longest time to realize that's the worst time to talk about it, that I needed to wait until he was ready. And then he would come to me and say, Dad, what happened to me in the third inning when that grounder went through my legs? And now I, got, you know, I was invited into the conversation, and I found that even that one simple thing of waiting until he brought it up changed the way we talked about his performances and he didn't see me as ready to 
correct and, and change and alter him and, and share my disappointment. He, he saw me as someone ready to help when I was asked. And so when he came off the field and he had let that ball go in the third inning, what, I mean, you know, my instinct, and I, I'm guessing others' instinct would be to just immediately say, oh, my gosh, what happened out there? How do you say, you know, how do you step back sort of and and just, I mean, I guess it's just it has to be a conscious decision on the part of the parent to say, okay, I'm going to keep my mouth shut, you know, and yeah. and yeah. try to be patient. Lisa, you're, you're so, on the right track there. We, we literally have to consciously in the beginning – um, work on new habits of how we're going to talk to our kids right after a, a contest of any kind. You, you have to realize that a, a, a child is over on the emotional end of the continuum, from logic to emotion. At the end of, a, of any kind of competition, a child is more emotional than logical. But when you and I have sat in the stands and watched the competition, and we've made mental notes of all the things that you know didn't go well, we're actually more we're being more logical we're being analytical and a person who's logical cannot have a real productive conversation with someone who's really emotional that those two don't match they don't go together well and so the 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 discipline comes to say i really enjoyed just watching you play tonight and that's all we have to say and then you know hey are you hungry are you thirsty where do you want to go and and you wait and you let the child feel whatever they're feeling. And if they, you know, they feel bad, let them feel bad. If they feel, you know, happy, let them feel happy. But we don't have to to comment at that moment. We need to be more like caretakers of their immediate needs. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? And let me know. And, and I'm here to tell you, I just enjoyed watching you play. Yeah, I know you didn't win, but that's not the only thing I look for. I just enjoyed watching you play tonight. And then you wait. And eventually, they'll probably, if they you know, know that it's a safe place, they're going to want to talk about it. It might be an hour later. It could be the next day, which will drive you crazy. But if you wait and are patient, it changes the kind of conversations we have. Do you know how many kids ride home from competitions staring out the window just wishing they lived closer to home so they didn't have to go through the, the ordeal of, of the rundown of how they played or, or defending themselves because their parents are saying, what, what happened to you out there? I mean, haven't we worked on this? What were you thinking? And, sure. and sometimes it's that blatant, and sometimes it's more subtle. Sometimes it's subtle conversations like, well, that sure wasn't your best game. You know, well, that's the same thing as saying I'm disappointed in you. Mm-hmm. If, a, if, a, if, if, if a non-family member said that wasn't your best game, that comes across differently as, as compared to when it's mom and dad. Remember, a child's greatest fear is actually disappointing mom and dad. And, sure. and, a, parent's, and, a, and a parent's greatest fear, and this is what gets in the way, we're afraid that our child is not going to reach their potential. We're afraid that they're going to play in such a way that embarrasses us. Or we're af- afraid that they're going to get discouraged. And, you know, so all of this, do you hear the word that's most common in all of this? It's the word fear. We're all fear. coming from a place of fear. And fear is not a good place to come from. I agree. I agree. Let me just give out the call-in number in case uh, people want to call with questions. It's 714-583-6853. Again, 714-583-6853 if you have questions for David about being a better sports parent. And, David, I I wanted to share with you a personal experience. My son, who plays tennis, is 16 now, and I think it has taken me at least five years to get to the place where it clicked in my brain that I need to give him 30 minutes after he walks off the court. And it Mm -hmm. usually... You know, if I can give him 30 minutes and just not say a word, but do the things that you suggested, you know, make sure he's got enough to eat or drink or, uh, you know, a place to stretch or whatever it may be, Um, but not talk about his tennis, per se, in that Mm 30-minute period. Typically, he'll, he'll then come to me and say, you know, what did you see out there, Mom? Or, you know, what do you think I need to do differently in the next match? Or, you know, whatever it is. But... Um, but I'm telling you, it took years, <laughs> years of those horrible rides home, years of, you know, screaming and him clamming up and me getting frustrated 
uh, before it sunk into my thick head that, you know, he needs time. He needs time to decompress, right. and, and I need to keep my mouth closed. But, mm-hmm. um, I, you know, I'm sure others have have had similar experiences, and uh, it, it's difficult as the parent. You know, we're sitting there. We know how many hours our child has spent. We know how many dollars we have spent getting them ready for this moment, this performance period. And when it doesn't go as everybody hopes, it's easy to let the emotional side take over, as you said. Now, part of that comes from the fact that we, we see these matches as being some kind of proof of something. We've got too much riding on the tournaments and the matches themselves. This is all part of developmental tennis. And it's, it is the journey itself, it is the process itself that is worth all the marbles, okay? So mm-hmm. when, we, when we find ourselves so emotionally attached to the outcome, that's when we react the way that you described, which is, by the way, the way I, I reacted initially also. And instead, we have to help our kids learn that these, these tennis matches or these games or whatever it is they're competing in, that's part of the learning experience, that every one of those is a chance to gather feedback about, about what progress I'm making, what lessons I need to learn, what is, what is going well, what's not going well. And sometimes, you know, it just didn't go well today. But but it's 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 too often held up as being like a, a verdict from the jury. You're good or you're not <laughs> good based on whether you won or not. And that's just that's blown way out of proportion. I agree. Can I read you a quote today uh, that that came up on on Facebook that I thought was so interesting, and it, it, it's right in line with what you just said. Um, it it was written by a, a tennis coach. And he said one of the most difficult things for a coach with hardcore tennis parents is having them accept their kids' losses without blaming everybody and everything for the loss. Two players go to play a match. Each parent has paid tens of thousands or much more for coaching. One will win, the other will lose. Next day, same thing. So they better learn from and accept those losses and understand why and try to make adjustments that will help the next match. And I thought that was so interesting. I mean, it's exactly what you just said, that it's about the process that not everybody gets to win every time. And, no. you know, in a tennis match, one wins the whole tournament, and everybody else in right. the tournament loses. Everybody. Yeah. So, so does, that, does that mean that everybody else is a loser? You know, that's, that's how this – that's what society and what sometimes sport has – made us think, corrupted our thinking into thinking we have one winner and then and therefore everyone else is a loser? No. Everyone else also learned and the the only way you the only way you lose is if you go home without learning anything. So we, we got to the point with our kids where we asked after every competition, okay, what did we learn today? Whether you won or lost. That's really interesting but irrelevant. What did we learn today? Because the kids who learn the most will eventually win the most. So I'm more interested in the learning than in the winning. I, 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 don't, I wish I could remember where I heard this quote, and I would love to say that it's mine, but it's not. And that is that a trophy <laughs> is nothing more than a symbol of my victory today over my fear and self-doubt. That's yeah. all a trophy is. It's just a symbol of my victory today over my own fear and self-doubt. It is nothing more than that. It is not proof of anything. It is not. It doesn't lift me up to make me better than everyone or make me more valuable. You know, watching Usain Bolt tell us how he is now legendary and how many times he had to you know tell me that. It's one thing if I say Usain Bolt's legendary, but for him to stand there and tell me how legendary he is is arrogance, and I, I find that so egotistical that it, it doesn't do much for me. But you know, mm-hmm. Missy Franklin, you know, coming out of the pool and saying, "I am just so thrilled with the experience I had here today," and 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 you know, this is just such a wonderful end to the year's swimming. And I mean, just a, a graciousness about the experience, but not about who this proves she is. Mhm, mhm. So interesting because what you're saying, I think, if I'm if I'm hearing you properly, is that we as parents. First of all, 
have to learn to separate our child's performance from our child. Our yeah. child is not his or her latest performance. Our child is our child, period, the end. And we right. then have to teach our children how to make that separation for themselves, that their worth, their value isn't based on whether they won or they lost. It's based on did they learn something. Am I, am yeah. I paraphrasing correctly? You, you, are, you are right on target. Um, w- w- the way that <clears throat> I used to say it to my son to remind him after a game where maybe he didn't play well is you are not the mistakes you make. Mm-hmm. You are not the mistakes. And, and conversely, when you win, isn't that a wonderful experience? But you know, don't think you're all that just because you won. <laughs> you, you're, <laughs> you're valuable either way, right? You're valuable... Yeah whether you win or lose. And so the the message for our kids to eventually grasp from us who are supposed to be more mature is that you are not what you do and you are not how you do. You, you, you're, you are a person who loves tennis, but you're not a tennis player. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. All yeah. right, I'm going to interrupt you one second. I'm going to go to commercial real quick. Um, okay. If anyone would like to call in with questions for David, the call-in number is 714 714- Five eight three six eight five three again seven one four five eight three six eight five three. We're going to break for commercial. We'll be back in about one minute. Alternative Lighting and Power is a renewable energy solutions focused company with an emphasis in helping athletic facilities. We would like to upgrade your tennis complex to the twenty first century. We offer a range of services that will upgrade your tennis complex. We can use our technology to make your facility virtually disappear from the energy grid. We can provide lights, scoreboards, scoring systems, cooling systems, heating systems, camera systems, covered seating areas, wastewater management, and even new buildings. Our company is located in Houston, Texas, but we provide services to all 50 states and internationally. We would love to visit with you about our opportunities. Please contact Ed Love at 832-549-4193 or email at elove at alternative-l-p.com. You can also visit our website at www.alternative-l-p.com. We are the sunny side of business. And we are back with Parenting Aces. David, we have a caller. I'm going to try to bring the caller in. I have a caller from the 410 area code. Caller, are you there? I am here. And hi, how are you? Hey, Lisa, it's Saul. Oh, hey, Saul. Do you have a question for David? Well, I want to bring up a little bit of a different, different scenario because it involves, you know, the tennis parent as well as, you know, if you want to go to the baseball side, which we talked about, my son is involved in as well. You know, a lot of times you have doubleheader games, and a lot of times on the tennis side you have two matches. You know, and the parent is the one that's there with the kid. There's no time to be able to stew between them. You kind of have to jump in. You know, so you know there there needs to be some kind of a different type of an approach that has to be dealt with in those situations. It's not just with the ride home. Damon? And so, what is what is your what is your question then? Are you saying? Well, it's not. Um, no, 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 I'm not. It's not being. I don't know if it's a question or trying to ask you to go into a little bit more in a different approach, whereas the parent dealing with how do they monitor or maneuver around a tough situation or even a real good situation when the kid needs to go right back on the court in a half an hour or back in the baseball field in 15 minutes, you know, and play their next game. You know, okay, so, good question. Okay, now, now I understand where you are. Now I understand. Well, one, one of the temptations for, for all of us as parents between games, for instance, or between matches, is that we, we mistakenly think – that this is a time for us to intervene. And we think that we need to get in there and say something that will right the ship. Now, the, the younger the athlete, maybe the more important it is to just step in and say, hey, you know, 
turn it around. You can, you, can, you can get a hold of this. I know it didn't go as well as you wanted to, but, you know, that doesn't have to affect the next one. You know, you, you had a lot of good things going. Let's keep it up. Good job. And that's it. But no coaching because the, a performance day is about performing, and it's actually not meant to be time for coaching. And what I see so many parents do is they, they grab their kid between matches or between games, and they start going through, you know, the 10 things you've got to remember for the next game. And, and they start shifting this kid's head over to the left half of their brain, trying to remind them of the mechanics of performing better. And performance day does not run on that schedule. That's not the way the human body is meant to, to perform. The, the human body is meant to perform on performance day by turning it loose to do the things that it has been practicing doing Monday through Friday. And if it doesn't go well during the competition, the next time we address that, we'll be back in practice when we do deal with the mechanical things. If you read uh, uh, Tim Galloway's book, uh, Inner Game of Tennis, you know he talks about self one and self two. And self two is that part of us that knows how to perform. It's a physical part that knows how to do something. And self one is the part that's talking to us, criticizing us, or telling us what to do. And self two has trouble functioning when self one is too loud. And if a kid has a second self one in the form of their parents, that's what makes it so difficult to perform well. There's too much talking. There's too much thinking. Let your body do what it knows how to do. So I, I found that the time in between was best um, served by encouragement, um, letting them know that we're 100% behind them. And, um, you know, if there's a question that they want to ask, absolutely ask your question. I'll do what I can to help you. But I'm not going to come in here and fill your head with lots of new ideas to help you in the second match. You need to figure that out. Does that answer your question, Saul? Well, I didn't know if it was so much a question as much as uh, just creating another scenario because, you know, again, you know, a lot of times, you know, the parent is the acting coach in those situations. And when, especially when you're at a, you know, when a baseball team, obviously the team's got its manager and its coaching staff, you know, but on the tennis court, you know, you travel to whatever tournament, and, you know, some kids have their coaches there, you know, and other kids don't, you know, and even though things, you know, could have been great or things could have been awful in match one, you know, match two technically is its own day, you know, so, you know, it's just, a, yeah. and if you have a parent, if you have a parent that is kind of, you know, in a lot of instances, you have some parents that are their coaches, you know, so, there's the, there's got to be some kind of a nifty fine line that has to come in between that to where what you're saying is 100% true, you know, from the parental side, but the coach has to come in somewhere and be able to moderate, you know, so, it, you know, the difficult part, you know, and I'm learning this because I've always been the son on the court, you know, now I'm the dad on the sideline who wants to go out there and be on the field for his son because he can't stand watching his son do it because it's torture. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're, and, and this is, you know, very typical. I know that feeling. I remember it well, being so emotionally connected to what's going on uh, and what our children are doing that we can't separate ourselves from it. And and that's the reason for the torture. It does not have to be torture. If we could separate ourselves enough to realize that we're we're giving a wonderful experience to our children and to let them both enjoy and suffer through that experience, because even in the suffering, there are lessons to be learned. But you see, when they suffer, we suffer, and then we think, that's bad. My child shouldn't have to suffer through this. Yes, he should. Yes, he should. He, he, he needs to suffer through, you know, being ahead and then getting beaten and figuring out, okay, wait a minute, how, how do I keep that from happening next time? And, and raising kids who can solve these problems on their own without the coach having to come in between and solve it for them. The best coaches come to a child, whether they're the parent or not, and they come and they ask some really good questions. They don't come and try to reprogram the child. They come in and say, okay, what... What went really well? What are you pleased with? What do you think uh, you'd do differently in this next match? Okay, cool. Go do it. I believe in you. 
and and you and you let you know you let them actually kind of answer the questions. Uh, so you're teaching definitely, them definitely. self-coach. Go I'm ahead. Sorry. Saul. Go ahead. No, I said I no, I agree. I agree with the appro- you know, with the tactical approach that you just finished saying. Yeah. And and on a it, different it, on a different scale is is in a tennis match when the kids split sets and can have coaching, you know, at that break between sets. I mean, that's an even quicker turnaround time. And you know, David, would you suggest employing those same tactics then? You, you said between. What? When they Between when the kids sets? split sets, when they split oh, sets see. in a te- in a junior tennis match, they get a a coaching break. They can have depending get, on the format of the tournament, but they can have coaching. Yeah, I see. Yeah, uh, once again, uh, we I don't think we do our kids um, much of a favor by trying to reprogram them, but if we ask them good questions that allow them to expose what's on their mind. So, you know, maybe a kid comes off the court and we've watched him, you know, miss his backhand shot repeatedly. So we immediately start talking about the mechanics of the backhand when that may not be the problem at all. The problem is he's distracted by something else, you know, some other thought, some other fear. And, it, you know, it's showing up symptomatically in the backhand, but it might have nothing really to do about the mechanics of his backhand. That's why it's so important to ask the questions. Okay, how are you feeling? What feels good? What do you wish you could do better? You know, share with me, talk with me. And if the child says, you know, I just want to be alone, okay, cool. Let's just recover. Let's get a good drink. You know, let's let our body do what it knows how to do. I trust your body. You got to trust your body out there, and just show the confidence in them. And um, you know, I, I think the the problem is we we intervene too much and we say too much, especially on competition days. We should say so much less. Can't argue oh, that. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's great advice. Great advice. Um, another point that I would would love to hear you address, David, is what happens when you're at an event as the parent and you overhear or oversee another parent, I, for lack of a better term, being abusive toward their child, whether it's verbally or, or God forbid, physically. You know, how how do you advise parents to manage those situations? Yeah, well, you know, that's a really tough one because it kind of depends on the kind of relationship you have with that person. Um, If you have some kind of relationship with them, then one of the things you do is you share what you've learned from your experience um, for instance, I, I've had other parents tell me since they've run into our website and our message that they'll go up to another parent and just say, hey, you know, I just want to share with you, I, I've run across this resource, and I just wanted to tell you about it because it teaches some really cool things. And you don't, you don't try to teach the parent a lesson standing there because it probably won't be received well. But you make them aware that there's resources out there that you've run into and you found beneficial. You know, you might say, hey, I just read this great book and, and you know, it taught me so much because I found myself so tied up in knots. I just want to mention it to you because, you know, I can tell that, you know, you and your child are really committed to this tennis thing. But I just wanted to share it. And, and you're, in a subtle way, just saying there are resources out there. If you don't know these people at all, to walk up and say, you know, something like, man, you're really blowing it with your child. You're probably in for a battle. <laughs> And, you know, why are you such a moron probably won't go over well. Um, so it, it, you almost kind of have to establish enough of a relationship with someone to be able to share your own vulnerability, you know, your own frailties and what you've done and that's, that it's helped improve your situation with your child. That's great. That's great advice. I know I saw, I'm sure you've, found yourself in this situation too, but I I have definitely found myself in a situation, especially uh, since I've been doing Parenting Aces and have learned so much from people like you, David, and people like you, Saul, and and all the other great resources that I've tapped into. Um, You know, I, I feel the need to share all the time, and I know that not everyone is receptive to my mm-hmm. sharing generosity, um, mm-hmm. and so I'm I'm having to learn how to how to kind of tone that down a bit and 
Um, I certainly, you know, I'm the first to admit that I still don't have it right. You know, I'm a work in progress. My kids are a work in progress. But um, it's it's very difficult for me in, when I see a parent and a child having the types of conflicts that I've had with my kids, not to say, oh, my, by the way, have you visited this great website, Growing Champions for Life? This guy has some really good advice you might want to follow. <laughs> Well, so. I think you start. By, I think you start by empathizing, and you know, if you get the parent alone and saying, "It's it's tough being a tennis parent, isn't it?" You know, you you, you empathize. You know, I can I can see that you're having some of the same challenges that you know we've had at our house, and you know, you, this person will go, "Boy, you got that right." And that's when you say something like, "You know, can I just share with you something that we found that works?" So you empathize first, and you identify, you, re- you recognize and acknowledge the feelings that they're having as being very normal and very natural, and then and then you say, you know, I, I used to feel the same way, but here's what I found. It's the old feel felt found, you know. I know how mm-hmm. you feel, you know, and here's what I found. Mm-hmm. That's great advice. Let me just throw out our call in number again in case uh, anyone out there listening has their own experiences they'd like to share. It's seven one four five eight three six eight five three. Again, seven one four five eight three six eight five three to call in and speak with David Benzel, uh, founder of Growing Champions for Life. And David, I have another another scenario to throw your way since sure. since we're going down that path. What what advice do you have for the parent whose kid really comes off the court and or comes off the field and just is beyond angry, um, just really, you know, screaming, yelling, tears maybe. I, You know, there are all sorts of different ways kids um, show that kind of emotion. But I, I know you said, you know, give them time, but... But what if the, if the child's behavior really is inappropriate? What mm-hmm. yeah. do you tell the parent? How how do we step in as parents to put a quick stop to that? Um, because I I found myself in that situation as well, where you know I, I've just I've said to my kid, you know, keep your mouth shut till you get inside the car, and then you can blow it off, you know, blow off the steam, mm-hmm. but. Do not say another word till you get inside the car. Um, yeah. But it, you know, it's a very difficult situation as a parent. I, I have run into this uh, with a number of tennis parents more than any other sport where they have come to me and said, um, my 11-year-old, even my 12-year-old, 10 years old also, uh, are just so distraught after losing that they they, they lose it and, and they and they cry uncontrollably and these are actually boys who, mm-hmm. who you know cry uncontrollably and I guess the other side of that are those that are uncontrollably angry which is just really a symptom of the same thing I've lost control of this match and now I'm losing control of me, and I either demonstrate it with my complete breakdown in tears or I show it with my anger, which is attempt to regain control. Um, I, I treat anger and crying a little differently. Uh, I think anger that is taken out on you know the racket, for instance, on the ground, you know, or oh. kicking this or kicking that, or, or abusive language then towards parents and onlookers, uh, totally unacceptable behavior. And there, there needs to be that needs to be addressed immediately about the fact that, you know, that that kind of outburst is not appropriate, and uh, we're we're going to work on that, you know. And sometimes there even has to be consequences, especially on the court anger. I think this should be addressed in tennis immediately. Uh, sometimes it's time out. Okay, it's off the court because mm-hmm. that. We need you to demonstrate the same kind of self-control with your emotions that you demonstrate with your racket when you hit a good forehand or your footwork when you get to the ball on time. That's self-discipline that helps you get there. Okay, that is, that is the use of your will to maneuver that racket in such a way to hit the ball perfectly. And I need you to demonstrate the same kind of control over your emotions. And they have to understand that it is within their control. It's totally within their control, but it's a battle sometimes. Now, the tears thing, I, f- I feel, is a little different because when, some, when a child breaks down and just cries, 
um, they don't even sometimes understand. I'm crying uncontrollably, and I I don't even understand. You know, they don't understand, and they're not hurting anybody when they cry. They're not showing really any disrespect when they cry. They're just at that moment not mature enough to control that um, uh, that that emotion. And w- one of the things that uh, I've kind of prescribed with parents is to find a different time when we're away from all of that emotion. So it's either, you know, during the week between matches where we, let's, let's talk about what happens to us after a match. Let's have a conversation about it. Let's talk about those feelings that come over you. Usually it's misinterpreting what a loss means. The child has interpreted the loss as being either embarrassing or proof of not being any good. It especially happens when kids lose to someone they they should beat. You know, you should. They, they have this idea in their head that if you bet, if you beat somebody before, you should beat them forever. And you you know, and I know that's not true. But they they get uncontrollable, uh, inconsolable because they lose to somebody they think they should have beaten. Well, you know, that's that's a, a, a perspective that we need to help them change. And that is, this loss today just meant that today you didn't play as well as on another day. Athletes only perform above their average 50% of the time. Are you aware of that? That's really, that's a great point. A great point. Yeah, yeah no, nobody does. I don't care if you're Kobe Bryant right. or LeBron James. or you, every, every athlete has a level of play for themselves that's their average. They're only going to play better than that approximately 50% of the time, and below that, approximately 50% of the time. That's statistically a reality. So we have to help them understand that that's, that's, that's what the nature of it. That just makes way too much sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that's so, it's such a logical approach. Yeah. But, but, in the, but in the moment, of course, as, as you, you know, got beat, your child doesn't have the emotional maturity yet. And, the, and so we're going to have to kind of let them work through that, but help them paint a picture. How would you like to react after a, a match? Let's talk about it. Get, let's get a picture in your head of how you would really like to respond after a very frustrating um, a match. Let, let's, let's describe. How, how would you like to be? Even, even if you're really sad, how would you like to respond? And help them describe the ideal self in the most frustrating situation. So they have some picture in their head of what they're trying to be. But you cannot have that when they're standing there crying in front of you or throwing a fit. <laughs> it's the wrong time. Sure, sure. That's, yeah, that's so logical. And I, I love that, you know, the, the suggestion of pulling them aside at a later time and, and having mm-hmm. them come up with the picture and, and describing yeah. it, putting it into words. And, and maybe, I guess, for older kids even committing it to paper or computer screen um, so that they can refer back to it uh, when things aren't going their way maybe is a good plan. But um, I need to break for commercial again. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, but for anybody listening that would like to call in that has any questions or scenarios they'd like to discuss with David, the number is 714-583-6853. Again, 714-583-6853. Six eight five three, and we'll be back in a little less than a minute. Hi there. This is Jason Haynes, the Chief Operating Officer of UR Tennis. I just want to take a second and introduce you to one of our top sponsors, the Nike Tennis Camps. Since 1975, these camps have provided young players with an opportunity to improve their tennis game. They work hard, make new friends, and most importantly, have fun. The Nike Tennis Camps are directed by respected college coaches and tennis professionals. These camps give players a chance to hit thousands of tennis balls and be challenged to play their best tennis. They will get great technical instruction and drilling from great coaches, supervised match play, and a variety of other fun activities. Please visit the Nike Tennis Camps at www.ussportcamps.com or call them at 1-800-NIKE-CAMP and take your game to the next level. Welcome back to Parenting Aces on the UR Tennis radio station. I'm Lisa Stone. I'm your host. 
And we're speaking today with David Benzel, who is the founder of Growing Champions for Life. David tours around the country and speaks to groups of parents of various types of athletes about how to be a better sports parent. And that's what he's speaking with us about tonight. And David, thank you again so much for being here and sharing your your own personal stories and the wisdom that you've gained from being a sports parent yourself. Um, one question I would love to to ask you is, what what's a helpful resource that you found when you were dealing with your own children competing in in athletics? What was your most useful resource? I'm embarrassed to say uh, that I didn't I didn't look and couldn't and then and didn't bump into any good resources during those days. Um, there might have been some out there. Um, but again, my kids are 28 and 24 now, and so at the time that they're in that, I, I was never made aware that there was some help for me. So now there was one thing that was good for me, and that was my wife. And I have found in many situations when there's one rather intense parent, there is usually a counterbalancing force in the family who sees that intensity and recognizes recognizes it for what it is and that it is not in everybody's best interest. And so my my wife was the voice of reason that would pull me aside and say, you know what, if you keep going down that road with our our child, son or daughter, I think it's going to have the opposite effect of what you really want. And she would say this to me and make me stop and think. And and I, I really believe that in most families, if both parents are at least involved in the youth sport experience to some degree, one is more likely to be the voice of reason than the other, and, and the intense one needs to listen to the calm one. Because we <laughs> overplay our hand. We overplay our hand more often than we underplay it. <laughs> and and that so really, I give... A, I give a lot of credit to my wife who was much more laid back. Now, the interesting thing was she was very laid back about our son's baseball and caused me to to kind of retreat a little bit from this alpha role I was playing. But, you see, my daughter and my wife were both still competing in their sport. I had retired from competitive water skiing, and my wife was not nearly so laid back toward my daughter who was still competing in, in the same sport. And I would actually have to, you know, help my wife calm down and be less intense when it came to our daughter. So so that was sort of interesting what happened there with us. And I got a chance to, you know, payback is tough, and I, I got a chance to do it. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you think that had to do more with being the same gender as the child, or do you think it had to do with familiarity with the sport? Yeah, I, th- I think in this case it had more to do with the, the sport, and uh, and that they were you know both in it and competitive, and um, so yeah, I, I think so. Uh, that, you know, there were some ego things going on, as there almost always are, by the way, between um, in, in us as parents, our ego gets in the way, and and I think my wife's ego was more in the way when it came to my daughter's sport. My ego was more in the way when it came to my son's sport. And ego is our wanting for ourselves, some level of satisfaction for ourselves, some accomplishment for ourselves. And and that's really a problem. That's really wrong on so many levels and, and prohibits um, the kind of relationship we could have with our children and even prohibits our children from... Um, reaching their full potential because our ego is actually getting in the way. But don't you think it's difficult as a parent to find the line between I want my child to succeed because this is what my child wants versus I want my child to succeed because this is what I want and figuring out, you know, where that separation is. Well, that that's exactly what the problem is, is that we have no right to want something for someone else more than they want it for themselves. That That's not our place. So if I want certain things that require you to change in order for me to get them, then I'm in your business. Whereas mm-hmm. if I look at what do I want 
that's all within my control. So when I say I want my child to win, I want my child to make progress, I want my child to impress others, I want my child to move up, all of those things require my child to change. And it it sort of insinuates I, I can't and won't be happy until all those things happen. Well, they're not dependent on me. They they all require my child to change. But Mm -hmm. if my want list was more like this, I want to thoroughly enjoy this experience of sport with my child. I want to be a person of good character as I watch my child. I want to be a trusted mentor and advisor to my child. I, I want to be a safe place for my child. I can have all of those things just by changing me. My child does not have to change one bit. That's great. I love that. I absolutely love that. And I, I, I'm listening to you say these words, and I, what I keep thinking is, and I keep visualizing in my head, is the child who says they want to be the best or to compete, mm-hmm. but really what they want is to make mom or dad happy. And Mm -hmm. they think by getting better or by playing this sport or by winning that that's going to make mom and dad happy. And I guess that's, you know, one of the things you're talking about, the challenge is, you know, how, how do we communicate as parents to our children that, you know, this, this is your choice. We are, you know, we love you in spite of, despite, because of, all of these mm-hmm. things you're doing, um, you know, it has to be your choice to participate or not participate. And I think and it's, even it's how, sometimes difficult. Oh, it, it, it is difficult, but you, you just said it right there. If it's unconditional love, and that's what I feel we're supposed to give our children, unconditional love no matter how they play the game, it really just asks the question of our children, how good do you want to be at this? It's not, this is how good I want you to be, which was really Andre Agassi's dad's message. This is how good I want you to be. I want you to be the best tennis player in the world. Mm-hmm. But a, a better a better route to having a long-lasting, loving relationship with your child and to teach your child how to have future, long-lasting, loving relationships with their children is to say, I will support you. How good do you want to be at this? I will teach you the connection between hard work and results. Okay, effort always gets results. I'll teach you that concept, but it's up to you to decide how hard you will work at this. Mm-hmm. So we, we're supposed to we're supposed to teach these life lessons about the connection between, you know, character and uh, and what that gives you between hard work and effort and what that brings you. We teach these lessons, but we shouldn't be saying you should be working harder. Because that's manipulation, and it, it implies if you work harder, I love you more. When you don't work hard, I don't love you as much. Very true. And now I'm going to just be devil's advocate here because there are some who will say, if a child says, I want to be number one in the world, that mm-hmm. a child isn't capable of making the choices and the commitments necessary for that to happen that an adult, a parent, a coach, whoever, has to intervene and sometimes force, you know, for lack of a better word, force the child to do the things uh, in order to reach that goal that the child says he or she has. How do you you respond to that? Well, unfortunately, um, the word that came to your mind is the one that almost naturally comes to all of us, and that is the word force. And it is completely the wrong approach, uh, but it is so tempting to do. And that is, I, I'm going to, you know, force you to practice, and uh, you'll thank me later. Um, you know, w- once in a while it turns out that way, but just as many times children come to resent being forced to do things. The better way is to creatively find ways to challenge our children to stretch and grow to creatively find ways to almost, if you will, trick them into experiencing the connection between when I work hard, I learn more. When I work hard, I get different results. But but it, we, we want to do it through a sense of power that we have as a credible person in their lives, not through a sense of force 
as a person we have in their lives, if, if you understand the difference. Force is to say, in a sense, you, you know, do it or else. Do it or it won't please me. You know, do it because I said so. This is all force. But, mm-hmm. but power says, let's go out and play. Let's see if we can hit 10 great backhands. Um, let's have a race. Okay, let's work on our speed together. Um, and and it, it involves uh, teaching these life lessons through a, a more creative approach that master coaches use. Now, and, and as parents, we're just a master coach of life. That's what we are. We're a master coach of life with our kids. And we're trying to get them to experience this abstract concept called self-discipline. And, and if, we, if all we do is discipline we, our kids to do things, we aren't actually teaching them self-discipline. In order for right. it to be self-discipline, we have to give them the chance to choose to do what they don't feel like doing. But if we never give them that chance to choose, you see, without a no, yes cannot exist. Without no, yes doesn't even exist. So I have to give my child a chance to say no. So that one day they realize, hmm, yes. Hmm. Now, there are certain things I, I don't let my child say no to, you know, you know, going to school. You don't get a right. choice in that. You will, you will go to school. Um, you, you will talk respectfully here in our home to, towards each other, all right? Um, there's certain things you don't, you don't get to vote no on, but I need to make sure there's enough things they do get to vote yes or no that they learn this experience of self-discipline, which is I don't feel like doing it, but I'm going to do it anyway. How do I trick sport, them into experiencing that? And sport is sport. is the perfect vehicle. Oh, it is. It is. It's the perfect vehicle because it's not a, a, a life threatening make or break deal. It just isn't. They're not. No one's paying these kids enough money, <laughs> right? Right. So that they right. have to do anything. So it's right. a great laboratory to learn this lesson. What is self discipline? And it it is purely, I don't feel like it, but I'm going to do it anyway. And we talk a lot, I'm sorry, I was going to say, we talk a lot about tennis being, you know, a great um, metaphor for life. That, you know, it's Mm -hmm. a lifelong sport, it's something you can play from a very young age all the way up to, you know, senior citizenship and and that there's so many lessons to be learned that can can be applied off the court as well as on and i tennis is really the only sport that i have direct experience with but but i suspect that you know that that type of mentality exists across the board with athletics in terms of the lessons that can be learned to make these children better human beings as a result of having participated in the sporting event. So, you know, what you're saying about teaching them how to how to say yes, how to choose yes instead of no. And um, you know, to me is is just one of those really wonderful lessons and I you know, I see it with my own child as I'm hopefully getting better at letting go and trusting him to say yes more than he says no, Um, you know, as he's now 16 and and can drive and and all of that. I'm I'm finding as a parent that I I really, I have to let him make those choices now. It's it's really not, there's no option anymore. I mean, he, he is at that age where I have to let him choose yes. Now, or choose no, and and That's right. look with the consequences of no. Yeah, and 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 of course, the easiest way to get to the point where you're at is to gradually work your way there, starting at age you know five and six, and and gradually get there. You cannot give them unlimited choices at five, all right. And, and you can't let them take total control of everything at six, seven, and eight. So it's a gradual letting go and letting them gradually assume more and more responsibility for the yeses and nos where we aren't going to get hurt too badly. And, and if, if you do all the, if you make all the decisions for them and give them no choices and then at age 18 decide it's time for you to make all good choices from now on, you know, good luck with that. They are going to crash and burn. <laughs> Right, and that's right. happened to many kids. They leave home, they go to college, and they crash and burn. They haven't learned to make good choices. They haven't learned to make any choices. Right. 
So that's so the, true. the psychology of the world is always about control. That's the psychology of the world is control, and we have to get out of that and be smart enough to um, let let the psychology in our families be choice and wise choices. What's a wise choice to make right now? Interesting. A, Very about interesting. tennis, about everything. I'll mention a couple of resources that I use right now because you asked that question. One of the books that I've become very fond of recently is uh, called um, The Price of Privilege. The Price of Privilege uh, by Madeline okay. Levine. And another book is um, Managing Thought by Mary Lohr, L-O-R-E. And, and, um, and I mentioned The Inner Game of Tennis. I think these are great books for parents to read that helps them play their role more effectively and, and, and to teach concepts to their kids. Those are great. I'm going to, um, I'm going to shoot you an email and get you to send me those titles so that I can put them up in the book section of the parenting aces website. Cause I do I entered a game of tennis is already there. That's one of my favorites, but I definitely <laughs> want to add those other two. We are just about out of time. So quickly before, <laughs> before we run out, I just want to mention David's website. It's growingchampionsforlife.com, and on his website, he has gobs and gobs and gobs of information for us parents. Um, he has a blog that he writes. He offers uh, free webinars from time to time, which I typically am publicizing through the Parenting Aces Facebook page or Twitter or, or our own website, so please keep and an eye out And our newsletter, they can... They can sign up for our free newsletter. It's a monthly newsletter right there, Winner's Connection, and that's that's free. Great. And, David, thank you so much for being with us. I really appreciate you taking the time, and thank you, listeners. That's it. Yeah, we'll, we'll, do, it. we'll do it again. I'm Lisa Stone, and you've been listening to the Parenting Aces podcast. For tennis parents, by a tennis parent. If you like what you heard, please subscribe. Subscribe to us and write a review on iTunes. For more information on navigating the junior and college tennis journey, please visit us online at parentingages.com. Thanks for tuning in and sharing us with your tennis community.